Oh, let's bring it back to studio. I'm joined by Lebo Ramafogo from the Seoul City Institute to just, to just get her perspective. Lebo, firstly, thank you for coming through and being so patient with us. Uh, we were taking that, uh, uh, those proceedings live, uh, and uh, unfortunately we had to delay you somewhat. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for your understanding. But let me start here. I saw that uh, during the time that this testimony has been on, right, while you were waiting for us, you simply refused to listen to it any further. You would, uh, when, when it's playing through the speakers here in the studio, you would be closing your ears. Yes. What, what is it that you don't want to hear at this point? It's triggering. It's the experiences of so many women. It's the experiences of so many women that we work with at Soul City. It is the experience of so many women I know personally who have spoken about the traumatic experience they have gone through. It is the experience of women who have spoken about how the law has let them down in the way that they will question. It is the experience of the fact that unless you are four months old or two months old in South Africa when you are a woman, if you report a rape, you've got to basically face those questions. It is the experience as a mother that there is a young woman who has got no protection. Here is a young woman who, over and above, having, having been so traumatized, is being re-traumatized, not only for anything, but it is also for the world to watch. Mm. In fact, that's important, Lebo, because, you know, unless you've attended a rape trial and, and, and a, a sort of experienced the, the degree of detail and, and perhaps the uh, pulling at the threads of the various uh, you know, issues that do come up uh, by the defense lawyers in particular to try and, and present the best case possible for their uh, client, you would not know uh, just how intense it really can be. Um, yeah. what, what, what is your understanding of why, uh, for instance, the level of detail uh, that they go into needs to be done in court? Well, what the law will claim is the fact that you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt. What I, as a feminist, will tell you is that the justice system is patriarchal. And when we speak in the field of social justice and in feminism that we are not, we are not fighting individual men, the change that we want is not for you as an individual to change, but for the system to change. This case demonstrates that. It demonstrates that the law, in its execution, is not pro-women, and therefore the law is patriarchal. It means that, and many women have said this, and I don't know why we are waking up to it now, and I guess one has to be glad that finally we are waking up to it. It means that we are in a system as women that does not give us a chance. So very few cases get reported, very few go to trial. The ones that do are the, are the tip of the, of, the, of the iceberg. And even when they do, this is how the system basically treats you. So the question we need to ask for ourselves is, what is the incentive for any woman who has been violated to go out and report? For me, what also is triggering me is the fact that in many other cases that I have seen on social media, I have answered men, black men, black South African men, who have said, oh, but why didn't he report? Oh, but why didn't he? Now they know. Yeah. Now they know the price you pay for reporting. The, we are not sitting in a country that has enabled the systems we operate in as women to enable us, even when we have been violated, to report. How important has Cheryl Zondi been as a, a survivor of rape and also as a witness in the witness box? Um, you know, to, in fact, in terms of standing up for what she says happened to her, regardless of whether or not she's believed, uh, regardless of what the, uh, the defense attorney thinks of, of what she's saying and what case he is trying to prove. I bow. I, I'm, I'm in awe. I just bow. I think we owe her, I, I don't know what, but more than gratitude, you know. Um, She's got grace, she is standing there, she is taking so much abuse. But I'm also angry, you know, because I think this narrative of black women having to be strong to endure that. So on one level, I celebrate her. But on another level, as a black woman in this country, you know, who has basically fought on issues of gender from even when I was her age, I am so angry mm. that we still expect a young black woman to have to be that strong. Nobody knows what happens when she goes home. You know, we can say, oh, she broke down the court agenda. What has this 
done to her life. What about the argument that says, um, you know, the allegations that are made uh, are, you know, founded not only in the Criminal Procedure Act in terms of how the trial is then conducted, but these are offenses uh, that are alleged in terms of crimes such uh, as, as that are, those that are founded on the Sexual Offenses Act, which is very specific on what a sexual offense is. And for the, uh, you know, for the judge to reach a guilty verdict, uh, you need to show that specific instances or specific um, events took place. True, and I think that's where I started when I mm. said the law will tell you that they've got to prove beyond reasonable doubt, okay? But as I say, you know, the, we are working with a law within a particular context. The law is very patriarchal, and therefore we understand why the law has to do this, but we are also not blind to why the law would do this, okay? We could in this country, nothing is forcing us to not have a different law, you know, that basically could be, I mean, he's, you read the tweets, He's condescending, he's accusing, and we are not seeing it for the first time. You know, uh, Fezeka, who we knew as crazy, was taken through that. You know, where lawyers are in the business of you as the person who has accused somebody of rape, you, you really stand on trial, mm. you know? So, so to what end? Yes, in this individual case, we are trying to, to, to you know, he's gonna buy the best lawyers, he's got a lot uh, uh, at stake uh, uh, for him, but is justice for women? Is justice pro-women? So that's another question we need to ask ourselves. And this leads me nicely then, Lebo, to my next question about the uh, institutions such as the National Prosecuting Authority. I had a question, uh, for instance, when I was listening to this debate about uh, the performance of Peter Doberman uh, in this cross-examination. I asked myself, why didn't the prosecutor object, for instance, to the question about uh, the centimeters? Um, you know, how deeply uh, did it penetrate you? Where was the prosecutor who, uh, in terms of these proceedings, um, is in a way, not necessarily representing the victim and the witness, but in a way he is because, uh, you know, this is the person who guides you through your initial evidence. It took the judge to, to actually say, I will not allow this question. Is the NPA then, uh, structures such as the NPA, are they adequately equipped to be able to be on the lookout for, for this uh, kind of uh, excesses? No, they are not. No, they are not. And they are not simply because they are working within a very patriarchal system. They are set up in such a way that they are not. And they've been on the spotlight for many reasons for not being very competent, you know. So, so that is what happens. And you are asking the right questions about uh, the NPA. And you, I guess the question you are also asking is, even within the confines of the law, which we know is going to you know, pull your evidence into threads, what could have been done? And I agree with you in a sense that, you know, there could have been an intervention. But, you know... Who, who knows what sensitivity should people be having? And I can say just from the snippets on social media that I had seen about that line of questioning that, in fact, you are not sitting with a pro prosecutor who is also very well equipped to say what is a, a triggering, what is a violation in itself, you know? How can you get to a point where you reach a, a, a beyond reasonable doubt, mm. proof beyond reasonable doubt without basically badgering the, the woman like I, that. I, I can just imagine, you know, um, in fact, part of the conversation that has been happening has been partly about that, but also uh, the other side, of course, that is presented there, Peter Doberman, at some point did argue that even the judge is, quote unquote, protecting the witness uh, from the cross-examination. But a final issue that I want to raise with you, Lebu, has to do with the power, the power dynamics. Uh, in, in the testimony that, um, you know, uh, Cheryl Zondi has presented and, and throughout the cross-examination, it's been about, you know, how she was this 14-year-old girl who looked up to this man, and it seems this man controlled every aspect uh, of her life. That's certainly her allegation uh, as presented in court uh, and is being tested in court as it stands right now. And this man, uh, in a way, you know, held the door to opportunity, not only mentoring, but, you know, she wanted to sing. Clearly, I mean, we, we were seeing some of those videos there uh, that I can open doors for you. Uh, we were at the same spot some years ago, and you, as you say about the crazy trial, the power dynamics that come up in a, a rape trial. What, what are we learning uh, that we didn't know already uh, from this uh, particular trial that's in Port Elizabeth right now? 
I think we are emphasizing the fact that, you know, these issues, and it links to the line of questioning, are just not black and white. You know, what was the sentiment and stuff like that. Context is very important. And I think for me, my other anger stems from the fact that these churches have mushroomed everywhere, but not only the new ones, also the Catholic Church. So as a state, how are we protecting people who go there? We know they are vulnerable. We know they may go there needing whatever counsel and counseling that they may, they may need. And therefore, it, 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 the power relations become skewed. You know, you go to somebody, you are vulnerable. How are we making sure that the people you are going to under the name of religion and God and whatever it is that they say are not going to abuse that power? Mm -hmm. So can we, so, so we've known about power dynamics, but can we as a country afford for these churches to spring up everywhere without any measure of control, so you're without parting anything? Short, you're parting short to me. Let's challenge the patriarchy uh, system, particularly in society in general, but specific steps on how we challenge it then in as, in as far as it manifests within the law and how these cases are conducted. What needs to change? I think everything needs to change. I think that the church is on trial. I think 80% of South Africans who profess to be Christians, including myself, are on trial because I'm not seeing 80% of, of Christians marching out there when, in fact, Jesus stood for the, for the downtrodden and the victimized. I think the state is on trial because we need to ask ourselves, why are we not protecting women? We need to ask ourselves, why is the NPA as incompetent and, and anti-women as it is, as we have seen in, 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 in the trial? And the justice system is under trial to be saying, ask themselves, can they look at themselves and say, how can they create an enabling environment? for women. So it is not only Omotoso. We are all on trial and we've got a lot to reflect on about whether or not we are pro-women. I've always said it. Women in this country are on their own and we've got no place to hide. All right, Lebo Ramafoko, thank you so much for coming through and again, thank you for your patience with us uh, while you waited there.